Hi guys and welcome to this video. In this video I'm going to be disassembling, cleaning and reassembling a Valjoux 7734. And one of the reasons I wanted to do this, it wasn't one that I'd planned to do but this is a watch that I'd just recently gotten in. And as you can see I've already removed, I've uncased it, I've removed the dial and hands. But one of the reasons I wanted to do this is because it is also the movement that the Polyot 3133 is based on. Often you'll hear people say that the Valjoux 7730 or the Valjoux 7733 is the movement that the Polyot 3133 is based on. That's not actually correct. It's the 7734 because this is the model that has the calendar complication, the date ring. And it is otherwise the same, but you've effectively got this additional module on the front. So beyond that, if you flip to the back of the movement, you can see the immediate similarities between a uh, Polyot 3133. If you have one to hand, you can see uh, in particular the chronograph bridge, which is this flying V shape, this Gibson flying V shape. If you imagine a guitar neck coming out here and some long haired rocker thrashing a, uh, a cool riff on there. There you go, you've got a Gibson Flying V. And the rest of the works are pretty much the same as the Polyot um, in terms of construction. I don't believe the Polyot has the uh, adjuster there. This screw here adjusts, spreads these arms and adjusts the actual depthing for the contact with the hearts on the chronograph wheels. I don't think they have that, but I may be mistaken. And otherwise it's, it's much the same barring the fact that the Polyot has been modified to a slightly faster VPH, 21,600 versus 18,000. And when Valjou made the 7750, which is very well renowned in terms of chronograph movements and used in many, many different manufacturers' chronographs, they sold all the tooling and bits and pieces to Polyot, who then pr produced their own variant as the 3133. So just a little bit of snippet of information there. So some people say that the 7730 is where the origins, where the 3133 came from. That's not actually correct because the there are a couple of differences on the chronograph side. One of them being the chronograph bridge, which is much more ornate and traditional in the sweeping legs and what have you um, compared to this. The 7733 is much like this but without the calendar complication and of course 7734 has the calendar module on the front and this is the one that all the 3133s are based on. There's also another Polyot calibre which is I think based on the 7736 if memory serves and that one has a an additional sub dial with a 24 hour counter we will begin the disassembly on the movement side removing the balance and the pallets after making sure that the energy has been let down which i've already done for um, informational purposes you've got this little access hole just down here and if i turn the, um, I don't know if you'll be able to see that. I'm going to zoom in so you can see that. Okay, so we zoomed in. So this little access hole right below the lower portion of the hammers, if you watch there as I turn the crown, you can see the tail of the click pop out there. So you'll need a, a small thin object that you can get into there. I just use, I've got a couple of old oilers that I use for various little bits and pieces like this. And I find this one particularly handy. This, uh, this is an old green handled oiler, which I've just shaped to a kind of a, a drill bit sort of shape as it were. And this one is great for things like this down here and allows you access to these small fiddly little recesses like that. So that's how you release the power. The next thing we're going to do is start the disassembly 
with um, the balance and the pallets and then I shall flip over, remove the dial side components and then we'll go back to the movement side. Um, from this point on I shall switch to the voiceover. So we begin as ever by removing the balance cock and we get that out of the way because it is a fragile component I like to get these out of the way as early as possible and put aside safely to prevent damage. Here I'm using an old oiler which um, I have two or three of these just laying around the bench and they come in handy for all kinds of things and this is just to help wiggle the actual balance and the staff out from the plate and it just prevents the risk of uh, damage to the hairspring. The next to be removed is the pallet cock. You can see there has a little bit of magnetism on that screw. It's sticking to my screwdriver and you'll note that as I lift the pallet cock away here the pallets come away with that. This is generally a sign that the pallet pivots have been oiled because they have a tendency to stick in the pallet cock or pallet bridge when that is the case and uh, here I'm just removing them just to make absolutely certain that there's nothing wrong with the pivots it's not bent or anything. Once they are removed we flip back to the dial side and I begin stripping the dial side by removing the calendar advance disc which is held by a single screw. This has a mechanism underneath which is all fixed in place and this advances the calendar ring. The calendar ring holding plate is removed next. What I should have done here ideally at first is removed the calendar jumper spring which you'll see me remove in just a moment and this is better done while everything is held in place and this is also how you refit the calendar jumper spring. You cannot make that stay in place uh, on the plate itself so you fit the plate and then you fit this in afterwards. You'll see that during the reassembly. Uh, these loose kind of calendar jump springs have a tendency to not ping so they're not such a big risk if you do forget to remove them before you remove the plate. The plate as you could see there was held by two screws, two securing screws. The calendar jumper lifts off of its post and then the calendar ring itself can be lifted away. And here I'm just switching my tweezers to the carbon tipped ones to minimize the risk of scratching the calendar ring. At which point I can go ahead and remove the outer ring which acts as a guide for the calendar ring. This is held in place by three screws of equal length and you can see up by my finger and just a little below are the two posts which are, fit, which are fitted to this this guide ring so the calendar ring can be placed back in only one orientation so it's impossible to get this back in the wrong way which is very handy And then we can lift off the hour wheel which has an extra geared wheel on the upper side of it and that is to drive the calendar advance wheel. And then using a presto tool I'm removing the cannon pinion. The presto tool is one of those useful things that comes in handy for many more things than its actual intention which is a hand remover. They can be a little harsh for hand removal I find and it's not very often I do use them for hand removal. I do occasionally but on the whole I prefer hand levers. 
and here back on the movement side we begin by removing the start and the stop levers both are held in place by a single screw of conventional clockwise thread the start lever as you'll see here has an art is an articulated one so it has a separate section sometimes some movements with this type of start lever have a separate screw which join those two parts together in this case it's held together by a rivet and there we remove the spring which provides tension to push the pusher levers back out next we move on to the hammers and we remove the hammer jump uh, the uh, hammer spring which is held in place by a single screw followed by the hammers themselves which are held by a single large central screw and as I usually do with chronograph movements wherever possible I will replace chronograph component screws especially on vintage Swiss chronographs because they have a tendency to have a lot of different sized screws and shouldered screws and all manner of oddities um, and this can make reassembly a bit tricky if you leave all of the screws out so wherever possible I like to refit screws unless they're glaringly obvious ones such as the large one for the hammers um, usually you, you get a very uh, heavily shouldered one for the chronograph bridge and so on and it just depends on the movement on uh, how familiar I am with it and how long it's been since I've uh, since I've dealt with one for example uh, one thing to be wary of when replacing screws into the chronograph bridge is that it does not protrude through and hit or damage any of the train bridge components uh, some of them can do that so here we're removing the chronograph bridge this just simply lifts up and away with its single securing screw removed and in this case I do refit the securing screw into here just checking to see that it didn't actually protrude through the other side and hit anything so we we'll remove the chronograph runner this just lifts clear away followed by the chronograph runner tension spring this is very similar to the one you'd find on a value 7750 and before we remove the uh, minute recording runner we have to remove the brake lever the, um, the chronograph runner brake lever and this is held by it's on a post but held by a little sandwich thin sandwich plate which holds above it uh, this is one area that differs slightly to the polyot 3133 where it's held by a single screw I believe if memory serves it's a little while since I've done a 3133 uh, there are a couple of little differences if anyone's interested I will do a video on uh, a 3133 service just to demonstrate and highlight the differences and similarities as you can see with the brake removed we can now remove the minute recording runner and then with the spring tension for the brake removed we can remove the intermediate coupling wheel along with the spring that bears on the brake for the chronograph runner Once again replacing the screw we then move on to the tensioning spring for the coupling clutch just loosening that slightly so that I can relieve the tension on the spring before removing it completely the general rule of thumb with a chronograph with any chronograph is any moving part if it has a tension spring that bears on it 
you need to remove the tension of the spring or the spring itself completely before removing the part and once again refitting the securing screws in place and then we move on to the coupling clutch itself removing the securing screw it's important that you undo the correct screw because there are of course eccentric adjuster screws around here and unless they do all need adjusting it's best to avoid those and try not to touch them because they can be a little fiddly to set up there you can see that's a little bit tricky so here I'm just using a combination of my tweezers and one of my hand levers. These hand levers are another tool that have multiple uses. Uh, they're incredibly, incredibly handy for not only removing hands but for separating bridges, uh, for lifting dials off dial faces and all manner of things because they're very thin, very strong and the faces are highly polished. Uh, just as a note, they didn't, uh, they don't come highly polished. That's something that I do to uh, to all hand levers that I use, is give them a good high polish because it helps to prevent scratches. Here I'm removing the two small securing screws, which hold the intermediate bridge on, and this intermediate bridge holds uh, several of the chronograph components. And once that's lifted away, the only remaining component is the chronograph driving wheel on the extended pivot of the fourth wheel. Unfortunately, I'm a little off the screen here, so my apologies, but here I'm just using two small pairs of hand levers, uh, or a small pair of hand levers rather, to lift that evenly up and away from the extended pivot. There is a specific uh, Presto tool for that, of course, and this last piece here is the minute recorder jumper spring. I did at one time have a habit of leaving these on um, when they went through the cleaning cycle but some of the vintage watches that uh, not so much the Valjus but the the Venus and the Landerons in particular use uh, incredibly fragile minute recorder jumper springs and I have in the past um, damaged a couple of them by leaving them in place in the cleaning machine so I tend to remove them and clean them by hand carefully now. Next up we remove this little fellow here with his surprised and uh, shocked appearance. As you can see the old lubricant has stuck these two together. And then we remove the ratchet wheel. This movement, rather unusually, has no reverse threaded screws in the chronograph works at all. There's normally at least one if not two on most chronographs and there was the click spring that we removed. Now we're down to the basic works of the train and we're going to go ahead and remove the three securing screws for the barrel and train bridge and the single securing screw for the uh, the escape and fourth wheel bridge. And what I like to do with uh, when removing train bridge screws and barrel bridge screws is to check the length and shape of the screws to see if they are all the same because it's quite common to have three screws holding a bridge and one of them be slightly different for some reason and it's all too easy to get one in the wrong place which can cause a movement to bind up or can contact a train wheel or something similar. It 
in this case all four of the retaining screws including the one for the single bridge that I'm removing here are the same size and length. You'll note as I lift this bridge away that the escape wheel actually comes away with the bridge and again this is just down to old lubricant making the pivot stick into its jewel there and here I'm uh, removing that and just physically checking the pivots to make sure that there's nothing bent or sticking or damaged. And here once again I'm using my hand lever to help separate the barrel and train bridge. That can be lifted away and we can then remove the train of wheels, the second, third and fourth wheels accordingly. You'll note that the fourth wheel on this is a little fiddly and awkward to remove as the wheel fits through a little gap on the plate just there. And this is another place where the Polyot 3133 differs very slightly. Well, it does take a little bit of wiggling and gentle persuasion as you can see, but as with anything, um, you mustn't force anything on a watch movement when removing or fitting. So gentle persuasion is always the answer. And then we can remove the mainspring barrel hole, flip back to the dial side of the watch where we can remove the keyless works. So we have two screws holding the setting lever spring. And once this is moved, we can remove the, uh, the minute wheel and the two intermediate wheels which allow time setting. It's also very common to have one or more of these wheels stick to the uh, setting lever jumper spring on old chronographs that haven't been serviced in a good while and that might have quite a lot of old congealed oil and grease on them. So always a good idea to just flip them over and just check to make sure that nothing's stuck to the other side of the spring uh, as parts can be easily lost if you, uh, if you don't check. So the yoke spring is released and lifted away. This is a shepherd's crook type, followed by the yoke and the setting lever. And then finally we can draw the stem which will allow the clutch and the uh, winding pinion to drop out. And then flipping back to the movement side we can go ahead and refit the balance in its entirety along with jewels. And this is, um, is my preferred method of running it through the cleaning machine fitted in place with its jewels and then these are disassembled afterwards and cleaned by hand. I find this the safest method uh, for myself and there is no particularly wrong method so some people remove the jewels and run it through the cleaning machine that way some people remove the balance entirely from the balance cock and run it through the cleaning machine. Ultimately, whichever works for you is the correct method for you. There is no right or wrong on that score. It's just a matter of which feels safest and which one works best for you. And as the final part of the disassembly, here we're removing the mainspring from the mainspring barrel. And this is done in the usual manner. We remove the barrel lid the barrel arbor and then just walk the mainspring carefully out of its barrel. Depending on the condition of the mainspring 
in some cases it can be reused typically I will replace a mainspring as a matter of course um, except in very rare circumstances where a watch is not particularly old but has come in for a service for some other reason but generally speaking for the cost of a mainspring it's it's just a no-brainer so with that removed that concludes the disassembly of the Valju 7734 chronograph so if you enjoyed this join us for the rebuild in the next video and we shall see you there thank you for watching